Hi everyone, welcome to this podcast for the GCSE English Language Descriptive Writing Controlled Assessment. A lot of you in the next few weeks will be maybe looking at your controlled assessment on a scene of fireworks. So a lot of this podcast we can use for that. The one I will be looking at is an example piece from a couple of years ago and it was a scene at a fun fair. So we're going to be looking at an A grade or an A star grade answer. So hopefully at the end of the controlled assessment you'll be coming out like this. Or even for this podcast hopefully it will make you confident going into con- into the controlled assessment. So here's the piece we're going to look at and I'll read out. The scene of fun there. Dazzling those around, the bright lights flashed, almost blinding any who dare to look their way. The cacophony of sound, each clashing horribly with the next, is almost deafening. The burning, biting taste of diesel fumes burns the back of the throat of anyone who gets too close to the rickety teacup ride. The fun fair is in town. Hoping the next ride was coming soon, a group of excitable toddlers are being herded along by overprotective mothers, bobbing along like brightly shining Chinese lanterns. One lags behind, gazing wistfully at the waltzers, while his mother drags him on the teacups. Moaning and grumbling, teenagers are huddled on a corner. One clutching his can of lager like a newborn son, another crushes his can beneath his foot and lobs it over the heads of the unsuspecting crowd, a moving coconut shy to his girlfriend, whose face is tear-stained. She shouts at him, I can't believe you, she cries, hurls her last insult and storms away, quickly followed by a small group of girls. They spend the rest of the evening throwing dirty looks at the boys, none of whom seem to care. Spinning faster and faster, the waltzer's occupants scream hysterically. The louder you scream, the faster we go, a mysterious voice claims on the intercom. As the ride explodes with noise, the operator yawns and throws a lever. Outside his soundproof hut, the ride accelerates, then, climax over, it slows and stops. The controller strolls out the box and lets the dizzied people off their ride. Some go straight to the back of the queue, others teeter off, stumbling over their own feet. Resting, the waltzer is getting ready to entertain the paying public once again. Gritting his teeth, a man in the car park presses the accelerator to the floor, but to no avail. The grass is unrecognisable under all the mud that has been churned up by the cars that have been coming and going. His face reddens as the wheels spin, spraying mud onto a glimmering red Ferrari that someone was unsuspecting enough to bring. People are pointing and laughing at the owner of the Ferrari, who is running towards the crowd with a cloth sponge and bucket. Finally, someone is helpful enough to push the man on his way and he leaves at top speed, without a wave or word to say thank you. Excited and, and as loud as a megaphone, a young girl screams on the roller coaster, while her older brother uses all his strength to stop his eyelids from shutting. Her best friend in the seat behind is looking slightly green and is very much ready to go home. The little girl whoops even louder at the peak of the mountain and tries to get her red-faced brother to do the same. He's never going to take his sister to a fun fair again. Tantalising wafts of delicious scents pour from the hot dog stalls and burger vans, enticing the weak-wheeled civilians to sample their goods. Mothers turn out their pockets for enough to buy the overpriced food for their screaming toddlers. Teenagers squabble over who owes the money, and the girl who split out of her boyfriend is treated to a hot dog by her friends. Exhausted and frustrated, the older brother rolls his eyes at his sister, sprints to the demonic ghost train. The fun fair is in town. Okay, so like I say, this is a student piece. So there are going to be things that are not so great about it. But generally, this is a good piece. as an A star or A piece. One thing that is quite good straight away is the way that we can say how it almost comes full circle. Where it ends the first paragraph with the fun fair is in town. And it almost goes full circle to the end where it ends with the fun fair is in town. So that's a good structural device used by this person. So this got 19 out of 20 on for the controlled assessment. And the examiner said the description's accurate, has good details, um, uses impressive vocab, they use sensory and figurative language but in a mature manner, and they've got good range of well-chosen vocab. They've got 13 out of 14 for how good their content was, and 6 out of 6 for spelling, punctuation and grammar. So there were a few mistakes, a few times it was, wasn't phrased correctly or the wrong word was used, um, but generally it was a very good piece. So here's our mark scheme. So like I say, it got band four for both. So if you want to get marks, you have to get band four. And I'll let you read the controlled assessment marking criteria. So in your descriptive writing, one mistake that generally people make is they write um, a big story 
or they go a bit bonkers with their descriptive piece. You are just writing about a small description. You're saying a lot, so you're describing a lot about a little event. So when you begin looking at your creative writing and begin to write your scene at the fireworks or the January sales or the busy crossroad, whichever one you've decided or your group has decided to do, you should almost think of yourself as a camera looking down on the scene at a fireworks. So for example, if you are doing the fireworks piece, you could think of yourself as being a camera on the wall here. This is Bournemouth Pier on a fireworks night. Think of yourself looking at the pier, looking at the oceanarium, what else do you see? After you've written your first paragraph, which is going to be as a general paragraph about what you see as a whole picture, you can zoom in on these people. What is this person doing? What is this person doing? What are these couple doing? So if you're struggling to write a piece, just try to think of yourself as a camera looking down. And the, the key thing is you're describing what you are saying. You are not writing a story. That is the narrative controlled assessment. The one we're looking at now is the descriptive controlled assessment. So this is the structure you should follow for your controlled assessment. Paragraphs one, and six should be big picture paragraphs. This is the, you're the CCTV camera and you're looking down at the scene as a whole. So you're not zooming in on one person, you are looking at it as a whole. So if you are a camera in the sky and we're looking at the fireworks display, you're going to see everyone. And this is the paragraph where you're probably going to talk about your sensory language to give the reader a vivid image of what is going on. Paragraphs two, three, four, and five or where you zoom in. This is where you think of a character or a person and you describe them in detail. For example, it could be at a fireworks party, it could be a father and son with a sparkler. It could be someone who is selling hot dogs at the barbecue event. It could be the person who's lighting the fireworks. Paragraphs one and six is where you're looking at big picture, you're looking down at the scene as a whole. Paragraphs two, three, four, and five is where you zoom in, and this is where you are describing a lot of detail, but about a small events. So please don't write a story for these people. You're just writing a little description of a simple act. So how do we create a big picture? So it's easy for me to say just write about the scene as a whole, but in paragraphs one especially and six, we need to know how. So one way of doing this is using our senses. So using sight, smell, sound, touch, and taste. So there is a video on BPC English looking at sensory language. So if you need to do this more in detail, please look at our creative writing playlist. But the reason we use senses is to create imagery in the reader's mind and to make them feel as though they are in the scene. Everything that we use, sensory language, alliteration, hyperbole, metaphors, similes, everything that we use like that, every writing device, is to get image in the reader's mind. But also, bear in mind, you've got to keep your writing realistic. Make sure your writing is natural and enforced. Don't write anything which doesn't directly relate to the scene. So basically, if you're talking about a fireworks night, you've got to make sure that what you see, hear, taste, touch, smell, could easily be heard or seen or smelt at the fireworks night. So here is an example from the one we looked at. If you look at the first paragraph, this person uses sight. So the bright lights flashed, they use sound, the cacophony of noise clashing horribly against each other, and they use taste, the burning, biting taste of diesel fumes. So straight away in this first paragraph, which is the big picture one, remember, then the, the writer has given a vivid, fantastic, descriptive image to the reader. So within three or four sentences, we know what we can see at this fun fair. We know what this fun fair sounds like, and we know what it tastes like. So straight away, we're almost teleported into that fun fair. So you can also you, you can also use it when you zoom in on a character. For example, here uh, they use the word clutch, uh, we use crushes, explodes with noise, the sound was as loud as a megaphone, and the little girl weeps even louder. So all the way through, but in a subtle way, we're not going over the top. Every now and then, the writer reminds us what it sounds like, what it smells like, what it tastes like. So all the way through, we feel like we are there through the description of the senses. Although it is all set up within the first paragraph, almost, like I say, putting us into the description. Now, we've done our big picture, we've got to do paragraphs two, three, four, and five. This is where we zoom in on a character and describe what they're doing. So it's basically up to you, your characters do.
doing and who your character is so you could do it about a group of people you could do it about a couple you could do it about a young boy a young girl an old age pensioner a warring couple you can pick whatever you want to do so if we look how it's structured in the scene at funfair example the first paragraph is big picture so we're not focusing on anyone we're just getting a description of how the funfair looks at a whole the second paragraph we've zoomed in with excitable toddlers the third paragraph we've zoomed in with moaning and grumbling teenagers the next paragraph we've zoomed in where we're looking at the people on the waltzer the next paragraph is a man who cannot get his car out of the mud the next paragraph is a young girl who's on the roller coaster and then we end up with zooming back out and looking as the fireworks on the whole and what this person actually does is he actually ends the story for each of the people in it so we're told about the mother we're told about the toddlers we're told about the young girl and what they end up doing with the night so that's an easy way of structuring your answer remember first paragraph big picture zoom in zoom in zoom in zoom in and end with the big picture so when you zoom in the first sentence is introducing the character and a brief description of what they're doing the second and third sentences are describing their actions and their movements in detail are they happy sad frustrated paint a picture paint a picture to the reader and what your people are doing remember to focus on their actions and movements and don't just write big descriptions about how they look well the fourth sentence is almost saying saying goodbye and finishing the description so if we look at an example of that this is from the one we're looking at the first sentence introduced the character and what they're doing. Excited and loud as a megaphone, a young girl screams on the roller coaster while her older brother uses all his strength to stop his eyelids from shutting. So they've introduced the character of the young girl. They've told us what she's doing. She's screaming on the roller coaster and also that her brother is bored. Also, the fact that they used um, excited and the simile as loud as a megaphone makes it a bit more interesting. The second and third sentence describing their actions and movements. So um, her best friend is sitting behind looks slightly green, very much ready to go home. The little girl weeps even louder at the peak of the mountain and she's trying to get her embarrassed brother to do the same. And then the last sentence, say goodbye, finish the description. So our final sentence is he's never going to take his sisters again. So this is this one sentence, it's a short sentence which gives it emphasis as well. This last sentence just sums up the story by saying the brother is completely fed up while the girl is still absolutely loving it and enjoying herself. So adjectives, verbs and adverbs. So obviously in a descriptive piece you need to use adjectives and adverbs which are the describing words. You also need to use verbs, the doing words, as Obviously, you always need to use verbs in the sentence, but in your descriptions, you are going to do a lot about telling us what the person is doing and their actions. So obviously, you need verbs for that. So this is what we don't want. We don't want descriptions like this. I'm not going to read it all. The frilly, fluffy clouds soared stupendously over cantankerous children. Tired teachers, vigorous, volatile children. What we don't want is a sort of immature response where every single word you're using two or three adjectives. That's what we don't want. We want it done in a subtle way, but also... All of these things are almost describing the person's appearance. We want to describe movement and action. So here is the, I won't go through them all, but this is the scene at the fun fair. Here are all the descriptive words, which the writer actually does use some good ones. So um, the cacophony, cacophony means all the different kind of sounds. The burning and biting taste, the rickety teacup ride. So a teacup ride in our head um, is just a normal ride at a fairground. But the, the fact rickety almost sounds like it's going to be it's going to break any second does make it a lot more descriptive. So um, the crowd it wasn't just a crowd it was an unsuspecting crowd. The girl's face were, wasn't just a face it was tear stained which tells us um, she was upset. So all of these things all of these adjectives are a lot more interesting for the reader. And here they are in a bit closer detail. So if you want to pause the video feel free. So like I said before you've got to make sure that you describe actions rather than physical description so what the person is doing as opposed to what they look like so make sure you focus on the individuals or couples or whoever in your scene writing about what they are doing and saying is higher level compared to what they are wearing or their physical details so you are going to get a better grade if you make sure that you focus on what they're doing and what they're saying and describing that in great detail so here's an example so the what we've done is in red these are the movements. So basically in two sentences, we've got all these movements in. Herded along, bobbing along, one lags behind, gazing wistfully. 
drags him on the teacups. So in two sentences, we've got a lot of descriptions about what the person is doing. Painting a picture and making it a lot more interesting than the viewer. We don't spend too much time on describing the people. Again, in a few sentences, we've got the movements. Moaning and grumbling, huddle, clutching, crushes, lobs, shouts, storms away, cries, throwing dirty looks. All of these things are describing the actions of the character. So also what you need to do in your writing is show, don't tell. If you're not sure about this, there is a video on BPC English. So what I mean by this is you are showing me what the person is doing. You're not telling me. So by doing this, you're creating a mental image in the reader's mind. And when readers get a clear picture, they're more engaged in the story. So for example, a telling sentence would be, you're telling me the man was bored. It's very boring, not descriptive, would not get you a good grade. However, a showing sentence would be, impatiently, the mustachioed man tapped his fingers on the desk. So you wouldn't have to have impatient if you didn't want to. But the fact that you said, tapped his fingers on the desk, if you do that normally, you might do it in a lesson with me or a lesson with your English teacher. It might show that you've lost focus, that you're a bit fed up, you're a bit bored. So the fact that he's tapping his fingers, giving me a description of the character's actions, that makes it a lot more interesting and more, a lot more descriptive than just plainly saying in a simple sentence, the man was bored. So, gritting his teeth. So if someone's gritting his teeth, it means they're fed up, they're frustrated. If their face reddens, it means they're embarrassed. If this person was running with a cloth sponge and bucket, it means he's going to come and clean his car. But the fact he's running shows a state of panic from the man. So all of these things are showing me not telling. So I'm not getting told they're frustrated. They're showing me by gritting his teeth is a physical description of the person. The face reddens is a lot more interesting than the embarrassed man. So if someone's face reddens, it shows the reader straight away this person without a wave or word to say thank you. So straight away, instead of just saying this man was arrogant or this man was inconsiderate. This last sentence without a wave or a word to say thank you. This man has been helped, a lot of people have been pushing him in the mud and he hasn't said thank you. So straight away this tells the reader this man is not likeable. So another way of getting up the spelling, punctuation and grammar um, ladder in your grades is by using different sentence starters. This basically means the word you begin your sentences with. So one way you could make it interesting is by starting with two adjectives but two describing words. So that instead of just starting with the boy stared at his exam, all he could hear was the sharp snip of the scissors, if we use the adjectives bored and exasperated, it makes it a much more interesting sentence and actually turns it into a complex sentence. Another thing we could do is starting with an ing word. So straining with the effort, the queen did a backflip. Or hoping that no one recognised her, Lady Gaga did her weekly as the shop. You could also start with an ly word. So cheerfully, Mr Bruff dug the grave for his pet rabbit. Slowly blowing out the candles, Mr. Hayne didn't have the heart to tell them it wasn't his birthday. So, use of the L wide word makes it more interesting for the reader. It also is an adverb, so it describes. So it's not just blowing out the candles. You can tell he, the fact that he's slowly blowing out the candles adds to the information the reader gets. He's slowly doing it. He's almost doing it in a manner which shows that he doesn't want to blow out the candles. He doesn't want to celebrate his birthday. So here's all the different sentence starters we've got here. So we've got dazzling, hoping, moaning and grumbly, spinning faster and faster, gritting his teeth, finally tantalising wasps. It makes it more interesting more information to the reader. So the teenagers are not huddled in the corner, they're just, they are also moaning and grumbling. So immediately it paints an image to the reader that these people are miserable, almost a typical teenager, almost Kevin the teenager from Harry Enfield. Again, spinning faster and faster is a lot more interesting sentence than the Walters occupants scream hysterically. If you begin it with spinning faster and faster, it's showing the reader that the ride is getting quicker and quicker as the screams go up. So try to use these sentence starters and it will make your writing much more interesting. So figurative language, again, there's a video on BPC English if you're not too sure about figurative language. And again, this is giving an image to the reader. So figurative language is normally describing something by comparing it to something else. And there are many ways to do this and we'll have a look at them now. So you can do a simile, so comparing something with, with by saying like, for example, it is as hot as the sun, so you're comparing the temperature now to how hot the sun is. Or Anchorman, you're like a miniature Buddha covered in hair, so he's talking about a dog who he thinks is very wise. You can use a metaphor, so saying comparing something again, but this time saying something is 
kite something. So this is from the new Bond film, and he's saying to James Bond, you're a kite dancing in a hurricane. So he's almost saying you're out of control. You could have alliteration, so this is the repetition of a sound. So alliteration is alarmingly addictive, so it makes it a bit more catchy to the reader. So here we've got repetition of A. We can have personification. This is giving something that's not human, human qualities. So the example we're here is saying that the piece of cake, um, the cupcake was calling to her. So it's almost saying that the cupcake is dying to be eaten. And you can also have onomatopoeia. So this would be quite a good one for the fireworks display. So this is almost a sound that sounds like how it's spelt. So for example, bang, hiss, buzz, pop. And we could also have hyperbole, which is basically a, a posh word for exaggeration. So, for example, this is the best, or if I've told you once, I've told you a million times. But just like everything else, you shouldn't go mad. Just like the senses, where it has to be realistic, don't go overboard on figurative language. So if we look in detail, we zoom in on the scene at a fanfair, we can see that a lot of figurative language is used. So, hyperbole straight away with exaggeration. Um, the person is saying the light is almost blinding. We've got onomatopoeia, so the sound, a very sort of expressive sound. The sounds clash. It gives a very good, easy image to the reader. We've got alliteration with burning, biting, rickety teacup ride. Just makes it a bit more catchy. It makes the writing flow a bit. We've got a couple of metaphors by saying the excitable toddlers are being herded. So it almost compares the toddlers to animals that are running everywhere and the mothers have to sort of herd them and, and um, make sure they go the right way. The other motif metaphor we've got is, um, doesn't quite work completely but it's okay, where he says a moving coconut shy to his girlfriend. His girlfriend is in a bit of a mood with the boyfriend. So she's almost saying that the boyfriend has got a target on his back and instead of throwing balls at the coconut shy, she's going to be figuratively um, throwing balls at her boyfriend. We've got similes where bobbing along like pri um, brightly shining Chinese lanterns. We've got that the teenager is clutching his can of lager like a newborn son. So almost like his lager is more important or uh, um, a child to a parent. Down here we've got hyperbole that the ride almost exploding with noise. So the exaggeration. It's not just noisy but it explodes with noise. Here we've got personification. Resting. The walker is getting ready to entertain pair in public once again so this is almost giving the ride human qualities almost saying it's going to entertain someone like someone does on the x factor here we've got a cloth sponge and bucket so power of free so this makes it a bit more catchy it's not just he comes with a cloth but cloth sponge and bucket we've again we've got a simile he compares the girl's voice to being as loud as a megaphone we've got a metaphor that the top of the roller coaster has been compared to the peak of a mountain We've got on a matter here of the word whoops. We've got alliteration with weak willed. So they're not just weak civilians, but they're weak willed civilians. And we also end it with sister sprints, which is another bit of alliteration. So some of these work more than others, but it does we've got figurative language all the way throughout. Some of it subtly, not some of it not too subtly. But it does work, it does fulfill the stylistic features at the top of the mark scheme. So finally we've got some top tips for your controlled assessment. Write in the past tense, so this has already happened. Don't tell a story. That is your narrative controlled assessment. You are doing a description. Use third person narration. So you'll remember you're the camera on the side of the wall. You are not a part of this story. So third person, he, she, they, the man. Check your spelling, punctuation and grammar. It is six marks out of your 20. So you've got to make sure you check your spelling, punctuation and grammar. Focus on action and reaction. So don't focus on what the person looks like. Focus on what they are doing. So you need to make sure you use your verbs. Use a few adjectives, but don't go too mad. So don't do like we did with that example I showed you where I went absolutely ballistic with adjectives. Use descriptive adverbs and adjectives. Try to begin sentence with as L, Y, I, N, G, or E, D words, or maybe perhaps even use two adjectives at the start of a sentence with a comma. So open with a paragraph which sets the theme and end in the same way. If you can do it, it'd be quite good to do the one we looked at in this controlled assessment, where someone uses the same phrase and almost makes it full circle. Uh, the fun fair is in town this person made. So it's almost like if you go back, mirror the introduction, that would be a good structural device for you to use. Make sure you zoom in on individual and couples and what they're doing, a small description. Try to use interesting vocab, e.g. not walk or talk. So try to make it interesting with the reader for you, sensory language and figurative language and show, not tell. That is the end of the podcast on the A grade controlled assessment, the scene at a fun fair. Hopefully it's given you a few tips to help you in the next few weeks when you do your controlled assessment. Any questions?
questions you can leave in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thank you very much.